My name is Andrea Nelson, and I'm the incoming Pro Vice Chancellor of Research here at Glasgow Caledonian University. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to our series of professorial lectures on behalf of the current PBC research, Cam Donaldson, who unfortunately cannot be with us this afternoon. Now, this lecture series reflects the public role of universities, which for Glasgow Caledonian University, as the university for the common good, is about how our research and teaching contribute to the sustainable development goals issued by the United Nations in 2015, running all the way through to the year 2030 and adopted by all countries. Today, as well as focusing on various aspects of inequality covered by the Sustainable Development Goals, I think we're going to hear about Sustainable Development Goal number four, which is about quality education, but also Sustainable Development Goal 16 on peace, justice and strong institutions. Now, professorial lectures not only present an opportunity for recently promoted professors to showcase previous work and future plans to colleagues, other stakeholders and friends and family, it's also, like all research, a social endeavour. To all the family and friends joining Jeff from various locations today around the world, you are all very, very welcome. It's lovely to see you. So now we're going to talk about Jeff in just a little bit. Now, Jeff Whittam took an unusual route to academia. After completing a Bachelor of Arts Honours degree in economics at the University of Manchester in 1978, and then a master's at the London School of Economics in 1980, and work, working as a computer operations manager at Shell Mex UK Limited. It was 11 years before Jeff took up his first academic post as a lecturer here at Glasgow Caledonian University. Jeff then moved across town to a lectureship at the University of Glasgow and in 1995 a readership at the University of West of Scotland before rejoining us as a reader in 2010 and becoming a professor in 2019. Jeff has devoted his career to making academic research relevant and accessible to wider society and has published extensively in the area of entrepreneurship, minority ethnic enterprises, social entrepreneurship and local economic development, studying topics ranging from business angels to third sector organisations via the Marshallian industrial districts of the Third Italy. As well as publishing in various prestigious journals, Jeff has worked with important stakeholders such as Unison, the Scottish TUC, the Scottish Left Review, the Jimmy Reid Foundation, Oxfam, Glasgow City Council and the Scottish Government. Quite a portfolio, I'm sure you'd agree. Jeff is currently an elected board member of the Scottish Community Development Centre, elected board member of Sunny Govan Community Radio and a member of the editorial board of the International Journal of Entrepreneurship and Innovation. He has previously served on a number of learned society boards, including the Regional Studies Association and Institute of Small Business and Entrepreneurship. And he's led or organized several international conferences on rural entrepreneurship, regeneration, enterprise, sports and tourism. A paper exploring the replacement of council tax with a local income tax was promoted by the Scottish Socialist Party and ended up being debated in the Scottish Parliament in 2006. Jeff's current research includes collective entrepreneurship, the governance of professional football clubs, the role of social enterprises during COVID, and the need to reform social care. 
Today, Jeff will discuss the many highlights of his work with national and local government, trade unions, and community groups over the years. And as you'll see, this lecture is dedicated to Jeff's father, who sadly passed away in December, COVID-19. So enough from me, please join me in welcoming to the floor to present his lecture on reflections on 30 years of an academic, what is to be done, Professor Geoffrey Whitton. Over to you. Hi everybody, <laughs> really great to see you. Um, it's a great uh, privilege to be doing this at uh, GCU. Um, as you'll know from the invitation, I'm actually uh, contemplating retirement at the, uh, the, uh, the end of the summer. So this is a very appropriate lecture to look back on what for me has been a, a great journey. The, um, as you can see from the title page, there I am completing a, ma a marathon. And so to some extent, it is fitting that uh, I am now completing my race. Um, however, as with all marathon runners, there's always more races to be run. So what I want to do is to, um, really the lecture is to split in, in three. First and foremost, is to give a tribute to my dad. Um, I love my dad very much and I'm very, very sorry. I never had a chance to say goodbye to him, uh, but he's, he's been a great influence on my life. I then want to really look at the academic life. And as was said uh, by Andrea in the introduction, my research, I've, I've always seen research not as some kind of academic exercise. I've seen it as trying to help what I would call civic society. And of course, not getting away from the fact I'm a, I'm a raging lefty, as, as everybody who knows me will, will testify to. So I've tried to be supportive to causes that I, I feel um, committed to, particularly fighting inequality, fighting racism. Um, and then the way I'm addressing this is to go through it in a historical perspective through the various stages. You'll see there's a lot of name dropping. This is deliberate uh, because there's a lot of people that have helped me on my way. And I've really appreciated the support I have had from colleagues, friends, networks. And I mean, I do apologize if, if I do miss uh, some people out. It's a bit nerve wracking doing this. And sometimes I do, um, I skip from place to place. And I want to finish off with some reflections. Uh, what has my journey actually meant? Um, and where, where are we going forward? I want to make some comments about the current uh, pandemic as we come out of it. And for me, it is what has to be done to try and ensure that we do bounce back better. Okay, so as you can see, my dad died tragically December uh, just gone just before Christmas and you can see you can see where I can get where I get my good looks from um, very happily married we can see the gathering of the clan uh, me, my wife Diane is here we'll say a little more, more in a minute my two young kids they're not so young now they were young at this photo this is when uh, my mum and dad's 50th um, wedding anniversary Three of my sisters are there. I believe two of them are online. My dad was a qualified engineer and we can see that he's putting his skills to good use as he's uh, uh, constructing and, and showing uh, Daniel and Patrick how to, how to uh, engage uh, in engineering building. Vocations, my dad, Christian socialist, played football for Accrington Stanley, allegedly. He was a Labour councillor, as you can see, for 13 years, and he led many, many campaigns. I just want to read out what was said by the, um, the father uh, 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 of the church. Uh, sorry, I just want to say what was said in a eulogy uh, about my dad by the minister at 
St Margaret's and my dad's funeral. Whenever I spent time with Brian, I felt that he somehow incarcerated this grounded, earthy, real, working class tradition of British labour, rooted in an outworking of his Christian faith. Its most obvious expansion for us at St Margaret's was when Brian ascended to this eagle to lead us in prayer. We were reminded with gritty Lancastrian descriptions of the plight of the homeless, the destitute, and those whose poverty, illness, or disability led them to be on the margins of our communities. As Brian prayed, so he desired that the community, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, be responsible for their welfare and well being, and for those less fortunate than himself not to be forgotten or neglected. And that is a fitting tribute to, it sums my dad up. My dad was a Christian socialist. For, for my dad, Jesus Christ was the first socialist. Like you say, he did, he, he told us all his life, he played Frackington Stanley. Um, and the reason why he, he, he had to quit professional football was at the time he was playing, there was a maximum wage of six pound a week. I'd like to see Ronaldo survive on six quid a week. Um, but he said that he could not bring up a family on six quid a week. So he went to night school, trained as a, 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 as a chartered engineer and had a very successful career with, with ESO. But really, you know, that was, that was my dad's professional life. He was also a, a, a community activist, being a Labour councillor, as, as I said, for 13 years. But even in later life, after, as we can see, the right-hand side, after retirement, he carried on campaigning work. The photo of the left is uh, of him working as the chair of the Clark Foley Centre in Ilkley. And this was the thing about my dad. He wasn't just content to be a member of a group or a member of an organization. He had to be at the center of it. He had to be the one that was the chair, the one that was leading. And like you say, you, you know, uh, as kids around the kitchen table growing up, we would have long debates about, well, did we have debates? <laughs> we were told that uh, socialism was the way forward. Um, so obviously my dad had a great impact and a great influence on, on, on my life. You can see just from these, uh, these are family snaps. The one on the left, the very first school photograph. This is me just trying to uh, show my working class credentials. Uh, you can see the picture tells the story. There wasn't a lot of money around. Right hand side, we come to uh, Diane, 30 years this year. Um, she's had to put up with me. And she's been a great supporter of, of, of all that I've done. And you can see two wonderful uh, sons, uh, Daniel and Patrick, both doing really well. I want it to be noted on this photo, though. I've got the half pint. Diane said, it's a good job the photo was taken at the start of the day. Moving on, then, the early influences, as you can see, um, education-wise, the significant thing, look at the top left four O levels. My dad had to go down to the school to plead that I could stay on to do six year. You were meant to get five O levels uh, so you could stay on to do your A levels. Um, so I wasn't uh, that committed at that stage. Please bear that in mind because I, I'll, I'll return to that in, when, when I'm summing up. Um, but, but at school at that age, I was too busy unfortunately, well, chasing girls and trying to get money to go and watch Manchester United. That was the, the main aims in life. But I managed to, to, to stay on. And what we'll see um, in a couple of minutes, the, the thing that saved me was actually politics. Man, I got into Manchester University where I actually thrived. I, I, I loved it. I can't speak highly enough. The stimulus I was getting, experiencing all... Uh, all new things and I, I just wish every child had the chance to experience university because it, it really did open my mind and from Manchester 
uh, I was lucky to get into the uh, London School of Economics. Again, fantastic time. Bottom left, we can see the principles of economics. That was the economics textbook I was brought up with. It's the one that was ubiquitous uh, at, at the time. And there's a significance to that, which again, we will relate to as we progress. And then ended up at Shell. I managed to run up debts being a student at the London School of Economics, shared a house with a guy who was working at Shell. He said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm just, you know, looking for work. Fill this form and I'll get you a job down at Shell. And surely enough, I went there and I thought, I'll, work, I'll stay a couple of years, clear the debt and move on. I had no interest in Shell. Shell was the enemy. Shell was the multinational corporation. Shell was the sanction busting in South Africa. But there was a job to be done at Shell. When I joined Shell, there was one union member in the head office. The rest of Shell was unionised. This was my chance. I could unionise the head office and go down in history. Nine years later, when I left Shell, there was still only one trade union member at Shell. I hadn't been particularly successful. And the big problem was, of course, Shell was a it was it was a great it was a great job, I have to say, if you could swallow the moral dilemma. But the cheapest pint of beer in London was in the Shell Mex Social Club, which give, gives you an idea of, of, of the conditions of work. I wonder when the last time the Soviet flag was shown at the professorial lecture at GCU. It may have been when Bob Arnett. Uh, gave his lecture. Bob was the head of economics once and he did his PhD on um, productivity in the old, uh, in, in Russia, and it may well be then. But as I said, politics saved my life. Politics got me interested. It got me interested in, in academia. It got me interested in wanting to find out why. Um, and I, I met some tremendous Tremendous people in the Communist Party. There's Rob, there's Jeff, there's um, um, John Reese, who are on, on the call today, uh, who I met in, in these times. There's many other impressive characters that, that I, 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 I really admired. And the, the thing about the Communist Party was self educated. We used to run classes, we used to have Das Capital reading groups. The big problem was. The turnover was so big, we never got beyond Chapter 6, Volume 1. We had to start again. So it was a bit limited in terms of my overall Marxist education. But I, you know, the big point and the reason why I've mentioned that is not something that you mentioned at the interview, that you've, you used to be a member of the Communist Party. But for me, it made a big impact because what it did, it developed a critical mind. But when I'd done my time at Shell, I, well, there was one day I just looked around the office at Shell. I thought, I don't want to be doing this the rest of my life. Like I say, it was, it, was, it, was, it was a wonderful job, but it wasn't me. So what did I want to do? Well, I thought about uh, teacher training. I did a, a stint at Jordan Hill. But after one teaching practice in Smithycroft at the east end of Glasgow, I realised teaching wasn't for me. But I had, a, I had a gap. I had a problem. I'd been out of academia for, for nine years. Very fortunately, one, one weekend, a, a very good friend, old comrade, John Callan, came up to, to Glasgow, went for a pint with him, Saturday lunchtime, met up with Bob Arnett, Bob Arnett, who was the head of economics. And he said to me, he said, listen, Jeff, the only way you can get a job in academia is to be around in September. If there's any spare cash around and somebody wants to get somebody at very short notice, that is the only way. So that's what I did. I hung, hung about in, in September. One day the phone went, could I come in for an interview? I went, I went in there and managed to blag my way into uh, Glasgow Polytechnic, as it was then, and got a year's contract. But I did, for me, which was a significant piece of work with uh, Catherine Kirk, um, and it was actually delivering a critique of what was the Scottish Enterprise Business Birth Rate Strategy. Now, at the time, 
it was the, the time of Thatcher, it was the time of Reagan, it was supply side uh, economics was the dominant thing. Everything was about enterprise and entrepreneurship. And the Scottish enterprise put forward this argument that the problem in Scotland was that wasn't enough new firms setting up. Myself and Kathleen thought, well, why don't we try and save the firms that are closing down rather than try and encourage people who, some people should not, should not be encouraged into entrepreneurship. I read a, a, the preface of David Story's book. David Story told us there's a woman with three kids, a single parent, trying to set up her own business, caught up in this euphoria of enterprise, entrepreneurship, you can do it. And Story said, well, you, you know, where are your resources? You've got no chance of doing it. This woman told Story, I'm determined to do this. Story went back nine months later as the bailiffs were leaving with the furniture. So quite clearly, coming from, like you say, from, from my perspective, what led me into question all of this was the background. This the, 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 the political understanding, if you like, led me to, to develop this critical, um, critical uh, ap approach to understanding entrepreneurship and enterprise. Deliberate picture this, one of the most ugly buildings in, in Glasgow. It is the Adam Smith building at Glasgow University. Uh, Japanese tourists come and start taking photos of it because it is the Adam Smith building. But after uh, Glasgow Poly, it was a one year contract. I was unsuccessful in getting that renewed. Um, and then by chance, I bumped into, uh, at the time, Christine was doctor. She's now a professor. But what are the chances of moving into a flat and your next door neighbour is actually a lecturer, but not just a lecturer, a lecturer in economics, not just in economics, but actually at Glasgow University. Just chatting away to Christine one day, she says, what are you doing over the summer? I said, well, I'm looking for work. She says, do you want to come and do the summer school at Glasgow University? I thought, yeah, of course I do. I went in and did the summer school because none of the full-time staff wanted to do the summer school. It got in the way of other activities. And at the end of the summer school, the head of the economics uh, department came to see me. He said, well, Jeff, you didn't mess that up, did you? Do you want a full-time job? And this was fantastic. So I, I started working at Glasgow University, working very closely with Christine, and I'm indebted to, to, to Christine for... For, for, for helping me to get myself established. We, we produced a joint paper, competition and cooperation within the small firm sector. And this is where I started understanding these Marshallian industrial districts. For me, this is a way forward. This was a way that you could bring about regional economic development through cooperation, through trust, through building the social capital, rather than the hero entrepreneur, the typically male white entre on entrepreneur. And so this really captured my imagination. And it was working with Christine that we managed to establish this, uh, th this, this, this research project. Three years at Glasgow and then on to UWS. And again, another uh, guy who deserves a load of credit for, uh, uh, from me is, is Professor David Deakins. Um, he was a professor of, of entrepreneurship, headed up the Paisley Enterprise Research Centre, and we did some uh, fantastic work, I would argue. But through this research centre, and what really needs to be said about David, he was a very open, very collegiate character. He would introduce you to all and sundry. You went to the ISBE conference and he would bring over people and, 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 and was really um, generous with his time. Uh, and also with, with, with these introductions, which were helping to build the network. The, the, the list of characters there, Laura Galloway, Paul Ferry, Mohamed Ishak, Paul LaSalle, Stuart Paul, Jeanette Wiper, Steve Tarbert, uh, Evie Hughes, I published with these on more than one occasion. We built up a real collegiate group. And of course, I bumped into my long-term collaborator, Professor Mike Danson, 
and myself and Mike um, travel, <laughs> tra I was going to say travel the world, we travelled uh, through Europe, many conferences, many great times, and again, very successful uh, publications. So I, I was gradually getting myself established and what we can see and, and some, some of the projects so I was very impressed, well, very impressed with the things that gave me great uh, gratitude and satisfaction were things like this baseline study of minority ethnic business in Scotland. And at the time, it, totally unreported the contribution that minority ethnic groups make to Scotland. Uh, and, and particularly in, in terms of, of the field of business. So Paisley Enterprise Research Centre under uh, David Deakins was responsible for getting this work done, paid for by the, by the Scottish Government. And then I was also then developing these other networks, these other contacts, etc. As you can see, the Regional Studies Association, very important to, in my life at the time. As I progressed, started uh, um, evolving into this Institute for Small Business and, and Entrepreneurship. And at one point I, I came across Kieran. And Kieran, um, great character, of course, his very first public lecture was at the ESB conference in Belfast. I was the chair, uh, sorry, I was the lead of the track on um, small business finance and Kieran uh, put his paper in. So I was in this meeting with Kieran. Halfway through, Kieran stopped the meeting. Mr. Whittam, I was still a mister then. I notice your eyes are uh, uh, closing. Yes, I dropped off in the middle of Kieran's speech. I woke up at that point, obviously, to be woken two minutes later with a fellow delegate hitting me in the ribs. I said, what on earth is this? Listen, I don't mind you sleeping, but please, no, store, no snoring. So that was my introduction to Kieran, and I've published with Kieran on, um, on credit unions and small firm finance generally. But uh, again, a, a great character. But we can see what else was happening. Um, as was mentioned, the role of Business Angels worked with Stuart Paul, published many publications. And we came across something, we, we, we corrected the, the literature on this niche area. It was always said that business angels were cashed out entrepreneurs. Actually, they're not. The majority of business angels in Scotland were actually uh, retired guys from multinational corporations. This Marshallian Industrial Districts, as was mentioned in the introduction, has become a central theme of mine. One of my PhD colleagues, um, Ian Cairns, said to me, you, talk, you were writing about that 20 years ago. I still can't believe you're banging on about it. But increasingly, I got involved in rural entrepreneurship. David Deakins took a post down at uh, Dumfries and Galloway and set up the um, rural entrepreneurship conference and annual conference and when David exited to, to New Zealand I, I took on the role of organizing with colleagues uh, the rural entrepreneurship constantly working um, in terms of poverty uh, reduction was a key aspect of mine and looking at this issue of uh, reforming council tax which I'll talk about a little bit more just in a minute. So building these uh, networks and, and with colleagues, particularly Andy Cumbers, as you can see, George Galloway, we started looking at ways in which society did not have to always operate by market mechanisms. So with Andy Cumbers in particular, we started running, we, we, we ran uh, alternative economic conferences, publication from uh, a, a joint edited book I, I, I published with, with Andy Cumbers. George, we got involved in, and, uh, along with Mike Danson, looking at community ownership, looking at asset-based community ownership, community buyouts, et cetera and came across other characters like uh, Gerard McElwee, 
very important in, in, in the field of this uh, overall entrepreneurship. Constantly working with the STUC, with trade unions on housing stock transfer, for example, the Stern Conference, Scottish Trade Union Research Network. But what was interesting about this, and as I said earlier, that what was key to me was always making the research accessible and working with third sector organisations, with civic society groups, with trade unions. And it was a two way street. I was bringing some of the people I was working with in these organisations into the university so that students were getting a full exposure. As I said a, a, a moment ago, I'll give a great example of this. What I think was a, a great example was the work that we did on the Scottish service tax, myself and Mike and Professor Christine Cooper. The council tax is a regressive tax. It makes the old tax system regressive. What does that mean? It means that poor people pay proportionally more of their income in tax than do the wealthy people. So we, 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 we developed this alternative Scottish service tax, which is based on a local income tax. And this is, to me, an example of how it is possible to combine academic work with serving the public good. We did this in conjunction with the Scottish Socialist Party. And yes, I, I, I worked with, with Tommy Sheridan. Um, and it, it really pains me what could have been, what could have been. I really don't want to go in the ins and outs of it at this, this, this lecture, but Scotland would have been a lot better place if men with egos just played the game differently. I, I, I don't really want to say more than that. But I, I mean, Sheridan, I, I cannot believe how, how, how he could have thrown it away, really. I'd be sat in a coffee shop, sat in a coffee shop with him. People from the street would come in wanting to shake his hand, wanting his autograph. But there we go. Anyway, and we worked with, uh, as I said, Professor Christine Cooper, great inspiration. She was head of accountancy at Strathclyde University, now over in Edinburgh. We got a publication in Capital and Class, an avowedly Marxist journal. I was dead pleased. I'd always wanted to have something published in Capital and Class. One of the reviewers denounced it. This is not a Marxist piece of work. No, of course it wasn't a Marxist piece of work. It was talking about progressive income tax. Anyway, we did better under Christine's leadership. We managed to get a paper published in a very prestigious journal, Critical Perspectives on Accounting. But the important thing about the Scottish service tax was it got debated in Holyrood. And more than that was the press coverage that it actually generated. And at UWS, it was used as the impact case study for the REF submission. So what was starting to happen then was this, uh, on the back of research, was that we were getting this out into the press. So the, getting the debate going amongst the general public. We can see the, uh, I'll come back to the sun uh, in just a minute, but I mean, it's fantastic the way the, the, uh, the, 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 the report things. And when I got made the front page of the sun, I thought, that's it, I've made it. And, you know, there we were. And what's the son accusing us of producing rich, uh, pr producing research, which was going to clobber rich landowners. That's a proposal in the Scottish service tax for a, a, a band four household. It would take the tax level to what the level of tax was under Margaret Thatcher. That's how revolutionary it was. It just shows how far we've actually actually moved. But you can see it wasn't just the, the Scottish service tax, it was getting reported and discussed in the press that we had uh, work done for, for Oxfam, bottom right. And then recently the work I did with Mike and Jeanette Wiper looking at this, uh, the, the, the introduction of a, a, a of a space port in, in, in the north of Scotland. Working with organisations such as the Jimmy Reid Foundation, Unison, etc. 
and this is, you know, the, 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 what was being reported in, in, in the press, reclaiming Scotland, Andy Cummins and Jeff Whitton explain the issue of Scottish left review, seeking to put forward alternative Scottish agenda, tackling social injustice, inequality, poverty and sustainability. So then after my time at UWS, I returned to uh, GCU, where I've been working with uh, Dr. Anne Smith and Julie Thompson. We organised the Regeneration Enterprise Sport and Tourism. We had to fit that in so we could have the REST International Conference. Um, the Royal Entrepreneurship Conference organisation continued. We took, took it to Eiley. Some people think that was the best conference they've ever been to. Um, and laterally, with, uh, I've started collaborating with uh, Alan Southern and, and Les Uckfield. And when I came to GCU, I'd, I'd already published in the area of social entrepreneurship. Uh, again, a very uh, keen paper for me was, um, sorry, the paper that I published there was taking a critical look at social entrepreneurship. I was impressed by um, some research carried out by Small, Smallbone and, and Ram, and they actually put forward this whole idea, this argument that you've got the market creating the problems, and now you're looking at trying to use the market to solve the problems. That hit a chord with me. I'm very supportive of social entrepreneurship, very supportive of, of, of other, other alternatives, but there is that fundamental contradiction which needs to be circled. And that if social enterprises keep on chasing the money, the social side uh, can be lost. UWS, sorry, at GCU, again, started working very closely with Dr. Fiona Henderson, um, sharing uh, over, over the odd drink and coffees, sharing ideas in terms of real, con real issues concerning with uh, social care. How can social care be re reformed and made better? We've seen the problems with social care just in, in the recent uh, pandemic. And a part of this, and this research came out of the Atlantic uh, Social Lab project, which Fiona was leading at GCU, and my, my thanks to Colin Coombe for involving us in this, uh, this work. And, it, and currently still working with Alan Southern, as you can see, looking at the limitations of enterprise policy for low-income communities. Collaboration started with Mike Bull. I'm saying it started. I've been working on this paper with Mike Bull for about 10 years. We managed to actually get it uh, published uh, uh, eventually. Okay, time's against, against us. I'm going to move on. So what are the reflections? Well, the big thing is never give up. From four role levels to getting a PhD, um, you know, you can do it. And so that, you know, I, I think if, if, if I've learned anything and there's a lesson to be learned for everybody, seize your opportunities. Um, I mean, is it just by chance that I bumped into Bob Arnett and Christine Alton and David Deacons or, you know, but the opportunities are there, just be aware of them, I would suggest. I would argue I haven't really compromised. And I would actually say that this is possibly because of be, uh, being a member of GCU, where it is the, the University of the Common Good, which hasn't tried to put limitations on the research I've, I've been in, uh, able to engage with, uh, it may not have been the same at other learned institutions. Build your networks and be aware that the life is beyond REF. For, for people who not, do not know what REF is, it's called the Research Exercise Framework, which tries to measure by some dubious output uh, mechanisms your contribution. I'll skip through this because I want to get on. So what do we need to do? Now, the fundamental problem for me is markets. There's nothing wrong with markets. The Soviet Union tried abolishing markets. It didn't turn out too well. But the point is, we need to control markets. We don't want markets controlling us. For me, there is a big problem, a big issue, that we might be going back to something like the 1930s. This is probably before the 1930s. It's, it's dock workers queuing up outside the docks. 
hoping that they would get picked for a day's work. You had to turn up every day and hope you get picked so that you'd get some money on the table. No social security systems, uh, no sick pays, no holiday pays. And of course, the big problem is that we may be heading back to that. We can see the top left. This is a 24 hour spot gold market. What does it produce? Where is the added value? It is financialization uh, and marketization taken to the extreme. And we've got this skewed system at the moment where, where and it is typically men working on these financial markets, generating what? The picture to the right, we've got the NHS workers who've saved us, saved many a life, uh, not just in COVID times, having to fight to get a 1% pay rise. So my worry as we come out of the pandemic is that we may not be bouncing back better. For me, the omens are not good. Just look at the way the NHS workers have been treated by Johnson. 1% rise in England. Thankfully, Sturgeon's offered 4%. But 1% is a thank you. And Johnson turns around and says, think yourself lucky you're getting that. There's many public sector employees have been told they're getting nothing. And many public sector employees worked through the pandemic. Bottom left, refugees. We've got Patel. I mean, what planet? What planet? Talking about opening up refugee centres to in in Cyprus. What was the country built on? What was the the land of the free, America? What was it built on? Refugees. Bottom right, the university rankings, and this is the problem. This is the problem. We've got marketization within the higher education sector. We're given individual metrics of what we need to meet. You've got to get your ref rankings. You've got to be publishing in three-star publications. You've got to be bringing in research income. And all this is measured. We're on the time and motion. And of course, we've got the zero hours contracts, the del delivery people top right, McDonald's workers in the center there. But maybe there is hope. And we must always believe that there is hope because what these two pictures are demonstrating are people fighting back. So back, if we take a look at that dot workers um, dispute and strike there, what we saw there was the, um, the ability to, to work out how to organise and to fight back. And likewise with these two photographs, deliver, Deliveroo workers, McDonald's workers, looking at ways of fighting back. And I think there is hope in wider communities. It despairs me when I think of what policy is being introduced to promote regeneration in low income communities. All the resources being sucked out of these communities and what's being given back. 50 quid enterprise allowance, go and set yourself up in business. Where is the logic in that? So this is why the papers on collective entrepreneurship is important. There are elements, there are ways, and in Scotland we're very, very lucky in the terms of having things like the Community Empowerment Act. We're talking about asset-based community developments, we're talking about the possibility of basic income. There are potentials of the way forward. So it's not all doom and gloom, but I am, I am worried about what we're coming out of, because of course we may end up with a, with a, 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 a social security system which is social security in all but name. And I want to pay tribute to a great friend of mine, Paul Laverty, who I've known since we were in Nicaragua together uh, a long many years ago, but been a great inspiration. And if anybody's not seen I, Daniel Blake, I urge you to, to see it. Okay, as I said, I'm coming up for uh, retiring. Um, the way forward for me, Sunny Govan Community Radio. I'm now on the management committee, having run my uh, my show Tinderbox for a number a number of years. Um, I've also been uh, 
Uh, I'm on the board of Scottish Community Development Centre. I've been approached to take over the chair of that organisation. Scottish Community Development Centre is something uh, uh, it does tremendous work in trying to promote um, regeneration, address issues of poverty uh, within low-income communities. So I'm very, I'm very forward. I'm, I'm very pleased and looking forward to taking over those posts. So thank you one and all. And just to say, it's been, as I said, it's been a blast. It's been a great journey. Um, I've had the opportunity to, to travel around the world. Um, I would not, uh, I can't leave this presentation without saying thank you to um, Elizabeth uh, McGlone. I also want to put uh, a special thank you to Declan Jones. With Declan, um, he's been a great colleague and friend, but I've given him something that he, 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 he can't replace. I've given him a line to tell at dinner parties. He gets all his pals around down at dinner. He says, guess what's happening at the Cali? And, well, what's happening at the Cali? We've got communists teaching entrepreneurship. So it's a great line for him. So I, I think I've given as good, given back uh, what I've got from him. Um, and one final sh throw uh, shout out is for Jonathan Scott out in New Zealand now, but he's given me opportunity to publish in uh, a book with David Deacons once again. Uh, so what's around comes around. So just to finish, I need to set the scene. This was the night before the last election. It was obvious the Tories were going to win. So what do we do? We need to get the message out there. So I decided when I was out for a quiet drink with Declan and Elizabeth, we were going to get the message out there and change the course of the general election. But all I'm trying to say is make the right decision. Think of the poor people and make sure your vote counts. Vote for the poor people and keep it going. Onwards and onwards. And that's it. Thank you. Right, thank you. I and you back to the host now, I think. So I'll stop the share. Thank you, Jess. That was brilliant. Thanks so much. We've had so many nice comments coming in saying how supportive and great you've been over the years. So we'll try and get through some of these questions. We've got quite a lot here. So I'll just kick off and get as many in as we can. So okay. the first one comes from John Crosby and he asks, what advice would you offer a new postdoctoral researcher embarking on an academic career in the UK? That's a toughie. Um... Um, I mean, I, I mean, like I say, I, unfortunately, this this is not a criticism of, of GCU. Like I say, GCU has been it's been very good for me because of the, I guess, my research. Is, uh, I would argue maybe the principal might have a different view, but I I would argue that there is a, there is an alignment, or I can make an alignment that the research that I've been doing has fitted in with the goals of the university and I've been able to publish on the back of it. I can, uh, newly qualified academics, I, I really <laughs> I really do feel, um, I mean, the pressures that they're being put under and really we've just got to try and work and, and, and get get the university sector as a whole to pull back um, and, because you know you're asking newly qualified staff to publish in three-star academic journals and bring significant sums of, of, of money in and that doesn't work we should not be competing we've got to and this is why I'm, I'm, I'm arguing that you know We've got to get in control of markets rather than markets controlling us. The problem is in universities at this moment in time, there is a complete lack of trust and cooperation. Well, not cooperation, but certainly a lack of trust. My work from Marshall in industrial districts will tell you that if you've got trust and you work in a cooperative way, you get better results. Because what happens if you don't trust 
people, you've got to introduce monitoring. You've got to be introducing controls on people. You've got to be getting colleagues to justify what the actions that they are taking. So I, I, I would say just very good luck. And, 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 and unfortunately, the way it is at the moment, we, we are completely atomized. Um, and you've, you've just got to really carve out time. Look at your contract. You, if your contract says that you should be getting research time, make sure you get the research time. Um, and I, I really can't say for, you know, more than that, to be honest. Thank you, Jeff. And the next one is from Nicole, and she's asked, have you got any words of advice, especially on career choices for people interested in being involved with policy writing, proposal and research, but are not necessarily interested in working in the government? Um, again, it's, it's really just, just being aware of what is out there. I mean, it would really depend on, on policy writing. There are certain um, umbrella organisations which would have funding to try to, where you could try and, and get some work working on policy issues. It really would depend on, on what particular areas of policy. If you're looking at things like poverty reduction and stuff, you'd be looking at Joseph Rowntree uh, Trust. You'd be looking again at some charitable organisations. I've, I've been looking in the past. Uh, I actually got paid for some work I did, did for Oxfam. Um, so it's really, it would be having a look around at, at, at looking at larger social enterprises, possibly some of the social enterprise uh, umbrella organisations to, to, to see what funding is, ar is around. Thank you, Jeff. Nicole, I hope that's helped you there. The next one is from Julie Thompson, and she asks, what has been your proudest moment of your career? You just saw it at the end of that video clip. Um, <laughs> no, seriously, um, proudest moment. I, I, I think it's some of the some of the papers I, I actually wrote. Um, I mean, the, the the ones that have have, have created. Well, I suppose to be honest, no. In fairness, the paper I'm, I'm trying to work on at the moment, and that is the contribution that refugees have been making in uh, in Glasgow. Um, I've, I've tried to get it published. I've, I've had it knocked back, um, but I think there's a very important story to be told there that you know refugees are not burdens refugees contribute they contribute massively to the building of of modern society um so that's something i want i want to get out there i guess i mean in terms of pr promoting debate and discussion it would be the work around the scottish service tax and whilst the scottish service tax was unsuccessful the smp has got as its policy the implementation of a local income tax. Um, the, they would not admit, admit that that's come from anything to do with the Scottish Socialist Party. It was just coincidental. Thank you, Jeff. That's brilliant. And um, we've got time for a couple more, I think. So the next one's from Lauren Tuckerman, and she asks, what advice would you give to early researchers about how to get your research out there and making it relevant and usable? Lauren, you know that. You work with Jeff Wissom. <laughs> no, uh, Lauren um, is a PhD student who's, who's doing very well for herself. She's got herself a post down um, at Oxford Brooks via Sheffield Hallam. Um, Lauren, I mean, it's a difficult one to say. I mean, you, you're doing all the right things. Um, you, you do need to get, get your paper put, um, into the journal circuit. Um, and you know, and really, it's a case of not giving up. If if you're getting a, a knockback, take on board the criticism and use that as a positive thing. And there's nothing I, I, nobody likes rejections, but I tell you, um, I could I could build a wall with the rejected papers I've had o o over the years. It won't be a very strong wall, but you know what I mean. They, they go from floor to ceiling, and. The, th the thing to do is just do not get disheartened about it. Um, speak to colleagues and 
if you you know if you, if you keep getting knocked back, try and get somebody else on on your writing team. Perfect, thank you. And then one last question. These are two questions, but about the same thing. So the first one is from Mike Danson, and he asks, how important has Manchester United been in your life? And the second one from Andrew Horn, who asks, how many times have you dropped the words Manchester United into your lectures over the last 30 years? Yeah, sorry, I should have given, I should have given Andrew Horn a shout out as well, as partly because of whilst I've always made my research tried to make it accessible there's been a number of, of people who've come in and given lectures and, and one was Andrew Horn he's, he's been in a number of times to speak to the class that I, 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 I'm the um, research I'm the research lead I'm the module coordinator for um, well everybody who knows me it's uh, the weekend is a lot better when United win put it that way um <laughs> But I do need to say, I want this on the record, uh, the times I went to United most was this relegation season, 73, 74, missed two matches home and away. And uh, so I'm, I'm not a fair weather supporter. And actually, going back to my dad, and uh, my dad always said the greatest night of his life was 1960. May the 29th, 1968, when we won the European Cup, beating Benfica 4-1. Um, and that, that, that was the first time we won the European Cup. I was 11 and I was there with my dad and it was tremendous. Thank you, Jeff. That's brilliant. Unfortunately, that's all we've got time for as we're approaching five o'clock. Um, but that was brilliant. And thanks for all your questions. I'll now hand back over to Professor Andrea Nelson to close today's event. So Jeff, or Jeffrey is your Sunday name, uh, or when you're in trouble. Thank you so much, Professor Whittam, for a tour de force, sharing the highlights of your career, making us realize that communist or Marxist entrepreneurship is not um, uh, an Irishism and something that shouldn't go together. But you talked about the personal, the political, and the impact that your work has had. I was really impressed not only by your acknowledgement of the field of collaborators, colleagues who've supported you in your journey, but also through the chat box and through your own um, lecture, how you've talked about those people who will take the fight forward as it might be described. So, so many reflections of gratitude and acknowledgement of a great career to date and goodness knows what Sonny Govan is going to um, face in the future and um, thank you so much everybody all of the colleagues visitors friends and um, former students etc for joining us today to celebrate Professor Jeffrey Whitton thank you thanks very much indeed Andrea. it's been a real pleasure and thanks, Sophie, for uh, coordinating. Thank you.